In this video, we'll be exploring videos, or as they are sometimes known, vodcasts. I'm Mark Pegram, and I'll be taking you through this material. Here's the usual copyright notice that you see at the start of all the online videos. Now, let's get started. Sometimes, as an older alternative to the term videos, you'll hear the term vodcasting, which is parallel to the term podcasting. But whereas podcasting is still quite widely used to refer to audio files online, the term vodcasting is not as commonly used as it once was. Like podcasting, the term vodcasting really refers to syndicated video files, that is to say, videos that are part of a series that you can subscribe to. If you mean videos in this traditional sense, then it is still appropriate to use the term vodcasting. However, given that the term videos is now more commonly used, especially to refer to standalone videos that are not syndicated, this is the term that we'll use most of the time in this video. As with podcasting, it's important to ask whether videos or vodcasting are an e-learning or an m-learning technology. Videos were originally associated with e-learning because you would assume that in order to watch a video, you would need to be stationary in front of, let's say, a desktop or a laptop computer. But in fact, what we're seeing is that global mobile video traffic is surging meaning that more and more people are choosing to watch videos on their mobile devices, especially as they move on to 4G networks or use Wi-Fi networks. So it is possible that videos and vodcasting are on their way to becoming an M-learning or mobile learning technology. As can be seen in this slide, video is expected to drive more and more mobile traffic in years to come. As of 2014, video constituted some 55% of mobile traffic, but it's expected to constitute 72% of mobile traffic by 2019. Here's an interesting overview from Mary Meeker's 2016 Internet Trends presentation of the way in which video has changed in nature over time. Feel free to pause this video and have a closer look at her chart. And it's worth remembering that a great deal of video sharing nowadays is not taking place on the traditional video sharing platforms like YouTube and Vimeo, but rather is taking place through social media and social networking platforms like Facebook and Snapchat. Students can be asked to use videos in a very Web 1.0 way by simply viewing them, usually fairly passively. The point is often information transmission, though videos do allow students to see settings and events and simulations which they might not be able to see in the classroom. In this way, videos do give students at least some access to the outside world. Even more than podcasts, videos or vodcasts can form part of a flipped approach. So students might be asked to watch a video or videos before coming to class in order to free up class time for more active learning based around interaction and collaboration. Some teachers may create their own videos that are specifically relevant to their students. They might then host those videos on a video sharing platform like YouTube or Vimeo, perhaps in a private channel or a private area. Alternatively, they might make the videos available to students in a password protected VLE. But it's not always necessary for teachers to create all of their own videos. There are huge numbers of educational videos available on public services like YouTube and Vimeo, as well as on dedicated educational services, such as those that you can see on the right-hand side of the screen. Some of these, like TeacherTube and WatchKnowLearn, 
actually vet and organize the videos. It's also worth mentioning that more and more national broadcasters, as well as commercial TV stations, make the programs that they show on air available for a certain time after they've aired. One example is Australia's national broadcaster, the ABC, whose iView icon you can see on the bottom left hand side of the screen. This can allow teachers to access materials which have already gone to air. If, as a teacher, you do create videos for your own students, you need somewhere to host them. As mentioned, it's possible to make them available in a VLE. But another possibility is to host them on a video sharing service like YouTube, perhaps in a private channel. That then allows you to embed your videos wherever you like, for example, in a website or a wiki. The particular video you're looking at here shows how to write and pronounce Aleph, the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. It was created by a teacher of Hebrew I worked with in Perth a number of years ago, and his intention was to create a whole series of videos like this one to help his students, all of them based on this model. Before we get to the embedding, it is worth noting that there are a number of services around which will strip away the extraneous material which typically appears around videos on YouTube and other similar services. The service I've used here is called QuietTube. I'm looking at the same video that you saw in the last slide, but as you can see, all of that extra material has been removed. Teachers find that services like this are very useful if they're showing material in class and they don't want students to be distracted by the other videos or the comments that appear around videos. There are a number of advantages when you host a video on a service like YouTube. It makes it very easy to share videos. It also means that you don't have to host the videos yourself and use up your allowance on your blogging service or wiki service or website, for example. Beyond that, it's very easy to embed the videos wherever you like. Beneath each video on YouTube, you will find the embed code. You can copy that code and as this Hebrew teacher did, you can then embed the video wherever you like. He's embedded his video about Aleph into a page about that letter, which is on a wiki that he's created. The plan here was to eventually create a wiki page for every letter of the alphabet and to embed a video like this one on each page. YouTube is of course only one possibility. These are examples of videos created by a pre-service teacher I worked with in 2016. They are science and chemistry videos which she created for her students and which her students were able to access on Vine. And here is a view of one of those videos that you saw in the index on the previous slide. Some teachers have now begun to experiment with a new generation of software that allows you to add in annotations and even quiz questions to videos. For some time, the most popular of these services in education was Zaption. Here you can see an example of a Zaption exercise created by a teacher I worked with in Perth in late 2015. In this particular case, the teacher who was posing questions to her students about the movie The Truman Show has given an example of how one particular student in his or her essay showed that he or she had learnt things from the Zaption tour created by the teacher. This suggests that this kind of annotation of videos and the posing of questions at particular points during videos can be educationally very effective. The bad news, however, is that Zaption closed down in 2016. But there are some alternative services you could explore, such as PlayPosit. Feel free to pause the video and go and have a look at this service if you're interested. Nowadays, it's also possible to add annotations and quiz questions using YouTube's own tools. This is an example of a chemistry video created by a university lecturer I worked with in 2016. 
pause the video if you'd like to take a closer look at the commentary written by this chemistry lecturer around the screen captures of the video. If we want to get students using video in a Web 2.0 way though, it's necessary to go beyond having them simply watch videos. Whether those are videos that we've found on the wider web or whether they're videos we've created for our students, even videos with annotations and questions within them. There is huge educational potential in having students create their own video materials. Until quite recently, it was necessary to have fairly expensive video recording equipment in order to make a video. That's no longer the case. Your average smartphone, your average tablet, your average digital camera will shoot video for you. With podcasts, some people choose to edit their audio recordings before publishing them, but others don't. When it comes to video, you'll almost certainly want to do some editing. You might want to cut the video in certain places. You might want to add titles at the beginning and credits at the end. You might want to add subtitles, for example. The best known software for doing this kind of thing is Windows Movie Maker on a PC or iMovie on a Mac. Many educators find that students are able to produce quite sophisticated videos without much direct input or supervision from teachers. If you'd like to have a look at a few examples, you might like to go to the Generator site in Australia or the Dragon Media site in Hong Kong and check out some of the very sophisticated videos which have been produced by students. You might also like to check out this anti-bullying video produced recently by a pre-service teacher I worked with in Perth who created this video with the input of her students. It's evident that in producing their own videos, students are acquiring a range of digital literacies, including in particular multimodal literacy. This is something which may be useful to them not only in future jobs, but even for college and university entrance. This is a fairly old infographic dating back to 2011, showing that even at that point, a number of US colleges were accepting one minute YouTube videos instead of traditional college entrance essays. Let's have a look at some variations on the basic idea of video producing. Some of these are very useful if your students are going to be putting their work out on the public internet and you don't necessarily want them to reveal their identities. Blabberize is a service that has been quite popular with teachers over recent years. You can use one of their stock photos or upload a photo of your own of an animal or a person. The important thing is to indicate where the mouth is on the face on the photo. You then upload an audio file and the person or the animal you've chosen will appear to speak that file for you. In other words, the sound will be synchronized to mouth movements. Obviously, this is a great way of students avoiding showing their faces and revealing their identities online. This is a nice example of the use of Blabberize by a pre-service teacher. The drawing you see here was created by her five-year-old son. She uploaded the drawing into Blabberize and indicated where the mouth was. She then uploaded an audio recording of her son introducing her ePortfolio. The end result was a figure that appeared to speak her son's words, giving the introduction to her ePortfolio. There are also a number of mobile apps which do the same kind of thing. This one is called FaceJack, but you might like to explore other possibilities in the app stores. Another service which has been very popular with teachers for quite a few years and which is now available in web and app formats is Vokey. It works on the same principle as Blabberize. You can upload an audio file, but instead of it being synced to a photo, this time it's synced to an animated character that you can create to look however you like. This is a Vokey character created by a member of the student services staff at the University of Western Australia. 
Here she has a Voki character explaining why she thinks Vokis are a useful tool. Back in January when we did our course, I had a number of requirements in mind for my resource. I wanted it to be flexible for users in terms of access and I wanted it to be able to be used by us in a number of different ways. But really what I wanted was to find a way of helping students share their stories with other students because they really place a high value on that sort of peer interaction which is actually very difficult to achieve unless students come onto campus and attend an organised event. The Vokies really allowed me then to find a way of hosting these stories that could then be accessed by enrolled students, by prospective students, people studying overseas, and of course by staff and by members of the public. The software was very easy to use and it was very adaptable and allowed me to embed it in our existing resources as well. And here's the project that Lisa was talking about. She interviewed a number of students around campus, getting them to talk about their learning journeys at UWA. Each student could choose their own Vokey character. It could be a character that looked very much like them or that looked completely different, but certainly they didn't have to reveal their identities. Not all of the Vokies spoke in English. The one on the right, for example, spoke in Italian. This is a very creative use of a Vokey character by a pre-service teacher I worked with a few years ago. He created a story for his science students about aliens invading the earth, and he set up a blog. This particular character, Professor Tinker, appeared regularly on the blog. Each time he reported on what the aliens were doing and set the students a particular problem, which required them to think through some scientific principles. The students went away, worked out their answer, came back and wrote it on the blog. Then this character, Professor Tinker, would appear again to respond to their answer, as well as setting them the next problem. So this was a very, very creative way of integrating a Voki character into a blogging platform. And here is another pre-service teacher reflecting on her own blog about the value of Voki characters. She relates a particularly interesting story about her granddaughter who became very enthusiastic about creating the audio track for a Voki character. In the process, she gained a lot of language and literacy practice. I'll increase the size of the text so that you can read it easily. You might like to pause the video at this point. Here, you can see a Voki character embedded in the top page of an ePortfolio by a pre-service teacher. What the Voki character does is to introduce the teacher and introduce the ePortfolio. So Vokis are really very flexible tools which have all kinds of applications in all sorts of areas of education. A relatively new service which does much the same thing as Voki is the app-based Telegami. If you're using an Apple or an Android device, you might like to check out this app in the relevant app store. There are also a number of services available which allow students to create animations or cartoons, sometimes involving multiple characters. The most popular service in this area, Extra Normal, closed down in 2013, but there are some possible substitutes. One of them is this one, Go Animate. Another one which has been very popular is Powtoon. And there's also MovieZoo. You might like to check out these and other similar services on the videos page of the Digital Learning website, whose address you'll find at the end of this video. One technique which has proven popular over recent years at all levels of education, but perhaps particularly at primary level, is green screening. This is when people are filmed against a green background, which is subsequently replaced with images or videos. For an idea of how this works, take a look at the video at the address you see on the screen about the Do Inc app. If you have seen one of the very popular RSA Animate videos, 
many of which are on educational themes, including a particularly famous one by Sir Ken Robinson, then you'll have an idea of what a whiteboard video looks like. If you'd like to create one of these videos yourself, then try out the VideoScribe service. Other similar kinds of web-based or app-based services which allow you to record a video of this nature along with an audio explanation include Explain Everything, as illustrated here by a Perth teacher. And here is another example called Show Me, illustrated by a Perth mathematics teacher. Note, however, that it's not just about teachers creating these explanatory videos for their students. It can also be about students creating explanatory videos for their peers, as in the example that we're looking at here. So pulling together what we've been saying about videos, it's possible to use them in a Web 1.0 way, where students are learning fairly passively through viewing but it's also possible to use them in a more Web 2.0 way, where students are actively creating their own videos and thereby becoming more involved in their own learning. On the downside, there is a certain amount of dependence on equipment, but actually everyday mobile phones are now able to shoot video. So it's becoming much easier to make videos, especially with the help of various apps that are readily available. There may be privacy issues if students show their identities, but it's possible to avoid this, either by storing videos in password protected areas or by having students disguise their identities, for example, through animations. For a summary of what we've been saying about videos and vodcasting and for links to relevant services, feel free to go to the videos page of the digital learning website which you'll find at the address at the bottom of the screen.